Hey, thanks for coming back tonight. You are a hungry people. And God always, always satisfies the hungry. So we will not leave disappointed, will we? You know, uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for your giving. Uh, I'll just throw this one thought out there. I was in, my, I was in a hotel room few weeks ago getting ready to minister and I just had this thought that if if God would to ask us to give and didn't ex, didn't expect above and beyond the return he would be unjust unjust and God is not unjust so wherever you just release not only financially but in every area of your life you expect a return and expect favor to follow so I, I just bless you with that tonight. I just want to release a few words before uh, I feel like I share what God's put on my heart tonight. Um, if it's possible, there's some uh, empty sections in here. If we can get everybody to move as close as possible to the front, that really helped me out. Uh, young lady here in the red, right there. Yeah, what's your name? Gabby. Gabby? How old are you? 19. 19. There's a a grace on your life. There's a grace upon us all, but the enemy has tried to stop the dreaming inside of you and the belief and hope for a better future. And the Lord wants to activate the ability to dream and to believe for great things for your life. And there's a breath of the Holy Spirit being blown on your ears and on uh, just your ears just to hear his voice. And it's blowing out every uh, dust of the enemy that tried to put upon you. And the Lord says that you are precious in his sight. And he wants to cause you to believe and to dream and to believe for a greater day in your life and to begin to believe. And as you begin to believe and dream step by step as you hear his voice and follow his voice, the purposes and the plans of God will be um, established like a stake going deep into your heart. And the Lord is going to teach you in the next two to three years about love like you've never known because he wants you to see yourself as valuable and loved. And uh, he's going to take your brokenness and even the shame and even the guilt and turn it into a place of great strength where you know your worth. And there's a testimony. The Lord did not intend that, but there's a testimony that will come out of it that will set hundreds and thousands of people free and there's a book that will come out and there's, uh, there's just great things but the Lord says this is a season of just trusting and even uh, like Peter he walked on the water and he walked in a place he could never walk before and it's going to take great courage and the Lord is releasing to you courage to be everything he's intended you to be. Sometimes uh, too, when I look to a section or something, it's like a ricochet effect, but uh, the young man in the back there in the black shirt, what's your name? Yeah, there, there's nobody behind you. Uh, what's your name? Jared? Jared. Jerry. Jerry, how old are you? 38. 38. Um, there's a call of God on your life to preach the gospel. There's a five-fold call of God upon your life. There's a strong prophetic gift. There's a strong teaching gift. Um, strong gift of revelation on your life. And the Lord wants to take you like a Joseph and put you through a season of preparation and grace to walk through the purposes of God. And to, I see like, um, like tools that the Lord has put in your hand and you don't even realize that you have those tools but the Lord wants to teach you how to use those tools and they're tools of authority and there's tools of release to launch you into the purposes of God and the destiny of God upon your life. Yeah. And that, that might, I feel like that might be out of the place that you're living right now but it's like the Lord wants to give you vision of, where, of, of not where you're at but where he wants to take you. And it feels like you're, you're living in a box and it feels like a box that you can't get out of and it feels like you're tied up. But the Lord says the box that you think that you're in is simply a glass box that all you got to do is push your hands out and watch them break in Jesus' name. The Lord says that the box that you feel like you've been in is an illusion of the enemy 
And that as you partner with God, that uh, those boxes would break one by one. And uh, the reason why it feels so strong is there are generational things that have been in your bloodline that you're going to break for your family. And there's something about the seed in your life. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground, it dies yet remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. When you break through, you'll break through for three and four generations to come for your family. And there's actually, uh, there's actually angels assigned to, the per- to this word that I'm giving you, that if you'll, if you'll say yes, and if you'll walk the path that the Lord has for you, they're sent to be assigned so that you would fulfill the purposes of God for your life. And that when you stand before Jesus, he would say, well done, good and faithful servant. And the Lord says, the Lord says, many times you've taken five and six steps ahead, but then it just seems like you're pulled back into some of the purposes of the enemy. And the Lord says, don't look back and just look forward in this season. Because if you look back, it'll define where you're going. But if you look up, there's hope that comes. And that's for about five or six people in this room. The Lord says, don't allow one chapter to define the next chapter. Here's another thought. Your present choices determine your future results. And what, what is your name here? Yeah. yeah. Joanna, that's a cool name. Tawana, okay. There's a, an anointing for intercession. There's an intercessor watchman call on your life. And uh, I saw an angel standing before you and he hands you an ancient book of things that the Lord wants to do in this region and where you live. And um, you're like... Uh, you're like one of these that the Lord showed me one day in prayer that uh, I just saw faces and, and I said, Lord, who are all these faces? These are people not well known in the earth, but they're known in heaven. You're known in heaven. And the Lord wants to trust you to begin to pray and to birth things out of your heart like a Mary that you would birth the purposes of God. And the Lord wants to release grace into your life, grace to just stay in his presence for two and three and four hours at a time. The Lord wants to just te- teach you how to sustain and to rest in his presence. And he's gonna open a door of grace for you to do that and he's going to streamline your time for the purposes of God and the Lord says open your mouth in this season because I'm going to fill it with great uh, great uh, weighty heavy words of authority so Lord thanks for tonight and um, Lord um, Lord um, thank you for your word and Lord, you know, uh, I'm just in need of you, Lord. So, but thank you for allowing me the privilege of, of, uh, of, of articulating what you have to say to your people. Lord, thank you that a man's gift makes room for him, brings him before great men and women. So Lord, thank you that's true in my life. And so Lord, thank you even for the angel that's behind me tonight, the angel of revelation, the angel that brings understanding. And Lord, give us understanding. We don't just want to hear, we want to understand and apply so that we could be good hearers of your word. Lord, teach us how to be a people who know how to disciple nations. Teach us how to be a people who fulfill the commands of Jesus on the earth so that your name would be glorified. Father, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Put your words in my mouth and... uh, that you would receive great glory, Lord. And um, Lord, thank you for the time of impartation tonight. Thank you for gifts and power. And thank you that you're, you're, the heavens are open. I just saw like a zipper open up heaven. So Lord, thank you for opening up heaven tonight. And be glorified in Jesus' name. Do you know that uh, we, we live in a world that is certainly not without challenge, but it is one of the most exciting times to be alive. And uh, it is one of the most exciting times to be alive in church history. There's never been a move of God in church history where the saints of God have been on the forefront of what God is doing in the earth. And uh, coming tonight, coming this afternoon, uh, being in the purposes of God is your training, is your schooling, is your intentionality to be trained in the purposes of God. So I salute you because this is a great time. In, 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 in every different, especially the last 100, uh, probably 114 years uh, since Azusa Street, God has been restoring truth to the body of Christ, and it is a truth, so, and, and if you can see what God has done over the last 115 years in church history, 
in these different truths that God brought forth in the earth, though, the emphasis was always on a particular ministry gift or a certain grace. Uh, let's look at two, just for, this, just for the sake of example. In the 50s and 60s, uh, they would, they, you would go to a tent because there weren't churches big enough to maintain the crowds. And it was the great healing revival. And the office of the evangelist was coming back to the forefront. And uh, you, you would come into the service. And if you watch some, uh, some of Oral Roberts, his crusade director would introduce him as God's man of faith and power. Now, some of us might find that funny. But it was what God was emphasizing in that time. He would preach an evangelistic message. And then he would lay hands on people for hours and the miracles and the anointing. But what was God doing? Not only was the office of the evangelist being restored, but uh, the gift of healing and miracles. And by the way, before all Roberts died, uh, he asked God, what's, what's happening in the earth? He goes, Oral, if you thought you saw miracles in the big tank, get ready because they're coming back big time. And one thing I forgot to do, this is also not only the year of the open door, this is the year of glory. So I declare... And I, get, I bear witness with the word of the Lord that this, this is a year of glory for your life. This is a year of glory for this region. The glory of the Lord has come in this region. It will come like never before. But the main emphasis was not on equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. It was, uh, it was, it was just receiving healing. In, in, the, in, the, in the probably uh, end of 60s, 70s, early 80s, the emphasis was, and, and, and part of the truth being restored was, and thank God, it was being taught the people of God that, you, that it was not a blessing to be poor. Thank God, that's in the Bible. You know, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. What's good news to a poor person? You ain't got to be poor. <laughs> you know, <laughs> thank God, you know. But really, if you understood even what the Lord was doing, and this is why I refused to point my finger. People go, you believe in that faith stuff? You believe in that seed time? I, yes, I do. Because really what was being taught to people there, and this is why you have to be careful, because what's really being mocked there is the authority of the believer. The authority that you didn't have to wait till the evangelist came down to town so you can get in the prayer line, you can wait for the move of the Holy... No, you could just confess the word and believe God for yourself and you could believe God for breakthrough. Yes, of course it was, you know, of course there were extremes, but it was a truth that God was bringing. And some of my, my mentors, they told me, they said, Abner, we used to go to the faith meetings and we used to listen for two and three hours and we would fill up our notebooks listening to, to different faith teachers, Brother Copeland, Jerry Seville, like we would listen for hours so if you think I preach a long time <laughs> but the emphasis was again the office of the teacher this is the first move of God where the emphasis is on the people of God doing the works of ministry yeah. and you see because when it, one of the things that uh, you have to understand is when God makes a statement in scripture he's not making a suggestion and he, he doesn't say, well, you know, since, since, you have tr since you have challenging times in America, you don't have to disciple nations anymore. The mandate to disciple nations is still here. And so I believe that this is a time in the earth and, because if we're going to disciple nations, everyone has to step in to the purposes of God for their life. And so I believe that we're in this season, but I also believe that uh, this is one of the things the Lord spoke to me. Nations are not changed through a one-time event or happening. Right. We're here and we're, as a community of people, as a nation, we are living in the results of, of, of choices we made yesterday, two years ago, three years ago, four years ago. And... Part of the challenge and sometimes one of the weaknesses of the charismatic movement, I believe in laying on of hands. I believe in impartation. My life's been changed by it. But everything in your life doesn't change simply because of one prayer of impartation. 
you can shift, you can, I've, I've entered in, my whole life's been changed in, in that sense, but there comes a stewardship, there comes a process, there comes a, there comes a working through that is the joy of God to work through in your life. So nations are not changed but through a one-time happening, but rather through a series of steps of obedience birth from revelation, now this is really important, that become a lifestyle for a group of people who will be known as reformers in the earth. Now, uh, this is maybe a negative example, but I believe this with all my heart. I believe that there was a door of immorality that was open in this nation when President Clinton was doing things with an intern he shouldn't be doing. And we are still, in many ways, in the repercussions of that because a power, the most powerful office in our nation was involved in partnering with immorality and it opened a door to immorality in this nation. So we're still reaping some of the negativity of that immorality around that. This is one example of how choices in one place affect a whole group of other people. And so I believe that the Lord is looking to raise up people who will navigate the purposes of God and realize that impartation is a part, uh, transfer of anointing, experience in a moment is all part of it. But I believe that the Lord is looking for people who will go the long haul. And one of those people that I'm so drawn to in Scripture is the life of Joseph. We know that there are certain persons found in Scripture that are types of Christ. Joseph was the beloved and rejected and the exalted son of Jacob. And he manifests certain unique characteristics typifying Jesus. So I want to look at the life of Joseph and I want to look at it through the lens of being a a people who stay the path that God has called us to stay over the long haul and also who are able to face some of the challenges that are unique to almost every person in this room. Here's some things uh, the Lord has spoke to me over the years about Joseph. He said, I'm raising up a generation of Josephs all over the earth who have seen and heard the promises of greatness for them and their generation. But many in this hour are being tested just as my servant Joseph was tested by my word. Many are being refined and I'm building in them the character to sustain them for the long haul. You can say amen to that. I'm building a generation of people who will carry out the purposes for the long haul and who will be architects of a culture of the kingdom that has never before been manifested in the earth. So do not look at the circumstances that you now find yourself. That's really important. Never define yourself by your present circumstances but by your present decisions. But look to me, the author and the finisher of your faith, and understand and believe every word I've spoken over you and your generation will come to pass. For is it not my word that declares my thoughts are precious towards you? For I have not forsaken any of my children in this hour, and I am guiding you through the process of destiny that leads to everlasting fruit and fruit that remains." See, sometimes you may not realize it, but you, in your challenge, God is actually answering that prayer that you had in that moment where you were experiencing encounter. You go, I want everything you have for me. He goes, okay, all right. I want everything that you have. Just take away everything that's not of me. So he'll go, okay, I'll introduce you to some circumstances that will allow you to do that. <laughs> See, he's answering your prayer. So you don't need to bind the devil. <laughs> The process of destiny will allow you to reap fruit and fruit that remains. And the fruit that will remain will be change nation, change lives, and I like this, a change future of the church. Do not despise the process of destiny and let the word of the Lord be your delight. For when you embrace destiny, you embrace the process of change. You know, one of the, the buzzwords, especially in, in, in our renewal movement, like, hey, what's, what's, what's the Lord doing? Well, we're in transition. I'm going, when are you never not in transition? <laughs> like, you know, God doesn't change, but if we're walking in Him, our understanding of Him is constantly changing. 
For my people to complete the task of Edom, they must embrace change. That's not something I particularly like. I like things all the same, honestly. I do the same thing every day, almost every day when I get up, even when I'm traveling. Get up, take a protein shake, I go work out somewhere so I can wake up. I like things in order. I don't work in my home office unless things are in a certain order. So what will God do? You know, like he'll put me in a place where everything's out of order. <laughs> no, no, I didn't. <laughs> uh, not like that. <laughs> it's not per- it's a general statement. I was not... <laughs> I remember, I don't think I've ever shared this, but I just feel like, I remember I went to Brazil, like I think it's been about three years ago, and like I said, I like things certain structured, and, um, and, and I believe part of that's the Lord, but you never allow a, a certain value system to dominate how you think things should be. And I got on this like two week trip, I get there, the first city, everything's disorganized, my, because I caught, I barely got on this flight to Brazil because of storms. My luggage is not there. Um, and they say it's coming. And so I was like, all right, you know, eventually it'll be here. But, and all I want to do is after like 25 hours of travel, just get to my hotel room and like, okay, at least I can take a shower and then maybe I can check my emails. So I open my laptop, and that's completely cracked. (laughs) And I'm going, what's going on here? (laughs) And I really believe that God allowed things to get out of disorder so I could learn how to function when everything's not in place how I like it. And I become, I, I used to be get very agitated when things weren't in a certain order. And I go, okay, I'm going to learn how to trust you, even when everything's out of order. I don't know why I said that, but here we go. <laughs> Genesis 37. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. He also made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. And Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers and they hated him even more. I think I would have stopped there. (laughs) Please hear this dream I have dreamed. And there there we were, binding sheaves in the field. And behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. Excuse me. And his brother said to him, Shall you indeed rule over us, or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. What's fascinating to me is that they didn't go to a dream interpreter, they just knew. (laughs) Verse 9, And then he dreamed still another dream and told it, See, I would have stopped at the first one. And told it to his brothers, Look, I have a, a dream and another dream, and this time the sun, moon, and 11 stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his fathers rebuked him and said, What is this dream you have dreamed? Shall shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but but his father kept this matter in mind. Now, this is really interesting in the start of the story with Joseph. Joseph, like those who are in the kingdom, those who are in Christ, uh, I encourage you to... Look at the phrase in Christ in the New Testament and how many times the Apostle Paul used it. It's really fascinating look. But those of us who are in Christ, we have absolute favor with God. Here's one of the things, though, about having favor with God. Joseph's favor with God caused him to have opposition in the environment around him. I'm not suggesting that we look for opposition. Some people, like, 
they ask for opposition and they're like, yeah, I'm being persecuted. No, you just have diarrhea of the mouth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, they're after me. Like, like no, like, <laughs> you're, you're a mean person, you know, like, <laughs> You're not nice. Like, that's not persecution, dude. It's because you're acting like a weird Christian. But there is such thing, there is such thing as real opposition when you pursue the purposes of God for your life. There is a misnomer, even as a people of Reformation, even though there's two tensions that run in the early church. One is that there's great joy in the city. You will have favor for certain pe- with certain places and certain people. The other, though, is to be honest, is you will also be greatly disliked no matter how loving you are. Jesus sends out his disciples and they go, he goes, you'll be hated by all men for my sake. True apostolic Christianity causes an opposition to the world around you. You can change the world, but you will still have opposition. And so there's two tensions that run. You don't look for opposition, but by obeying, you will have opposition. (laughs) And another thing, so his favor actually caused an opposition in the environment that he's in. And he also had a dream. In the dream, God did not tell him the opposition he was going to have. Often God will birth something so big in your heart that you're like, that's so far beyond where I'm at. Welcome to life in the kingdom. Welcome to walking by faith. And often he doesn't tell you the opposition that you're going to face because you're supposed to use the dream, the vision, the word, the understanding to, to, to apply to your opposition. You're not supposed to react to your opposition. Your dream is supposed to define how you go against opposition. There's a difference between reacting to your environment and using what God has said to circumvent the mountain that's in front of you. And so he has this dream, and here's another thing about walking in Christ. It is essential that you have a vision for where God wants to take you. It might start at a micro level. For some of you, it might be that I need to begin to develop an inner life with the Lord. For some of you who have already done that, it's a vision for the assignment that God is going to take you. Another person, it might be understanding for the next step in that turn. But you must have a vision. Proverbs 29:19. Now remember, this is not a suggestion. Without prophetic revelation, without vision, so it's not a suggestion. It's not like, oh, like maybe if you write it down, if, you know, if you're into Maxwell, it's without a prophetic insight because this is key to the life of Joseph. The prophetic insight guided every decision he would make from that day forward. And it is this hope that is supposed to anchor us. We are a people who are supposed to live with hope. The image of God makes you, makes your choices both sinfully and both for righteousness. They make you a powerful uh, person in the earth with the ability to write history with God. You are a powerful person. That's why he says, Moses says to the nation of Israel, choose blessing or choose cursing, it's on you. Because he's saying your human choices can actually cause uh, righteousness to flourish or can cause darkness to flourish in the earth. But a hope is supposed to anchor us of where God wants to take us. Now here's another thing. Opposition is part of your journey in God. This is really interesting. Because we know God, devil. It's not even, they're not even on the same playing field. That's really important because even in the garden, only God can improve upon perfection. Adam was made perfect and he's actually improved our position from Adam. But he could have destroyed the enemy. He was a created being. Part of, I believe, the delight in the genius mind of God is creating people, 
putting them on the earth and go, you know, you're just not even worth my time. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create people in my image. I'm going to give them a choice. I'm going to give them access to my genius mind. And as they faithfully choose to follow me, they'll destroy your works of darkness all over the earth. But I'm going to leave you around here because I'm going to show you that I can create free people made in my image who are more powerful than you. And out of their free choice, because you want worship so much, I'm going to show them, I'm going to create a people who will worship me as the highest expression of their life. And as they worship me, you'll be put to shame in everywhere you go. And so he's, he is actually, the enemy was made to be somebody at our disposal when we are united under God. That's another myth that needs to be displayed in, that needs to, like, some people think, well, if I just achieve the dream, or if I just begin to, you know, begin to manifest that, 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 that word about ministry or business, that there won't be any opposition. You are actually created to destroy every opposition that would stand in your way. You don't ever get to this Christian utopia where there's never any challenge to the purposes of God. God actually delights in free people choosing to follow him. The enemy cannot sin on his own. God wants us to be a people who allow our foundation to be be built deep in him. I remember one time the Lord said to this, I always remember I was uh, riding somewhere, he said, I go, what, what was happening here? Because I know that you're good, but this guy went through some challenging things. And he said to me, it was my mercy and my grace that allowed Joseph to walk through the process of destiny to build within him the internal structure to carry the weight of the authority of the assignment on his life. Do you know, I grew up outside New York City, and I live where God lives now, in North Carolina. <laughs> but one, uh, one of the things that you would you'd notice is they would have, um, and this is like a picture of like a prophetic promise, the vision that we're supposed to be anchored in. It, you'd have this picture of what this big skyscraper is going to be built. It's your prophetic word. It's a picture of where you're going. But they would, and they would begin to, and you're going, they're working on it. It doesn't look like anything's happening there. They were working on the foundation of that thing. And sometimes it would be a year, two years. None of that building's up, but they're working on the foundation of that thing. Some of you, it might feel like it does, I mean, nothing in that word is happening, and God's working on the foundation of that word. God's going deep inside of you. I remember, um, because God often, he works in increments. Like Sometimes people like, like, and I don't doubt that this could happen in a moment, but it's often increments. If you've never believed God for $50, you're probably never going to believe him for $10,000. And here's what we're supposed to do. You know, I've learned that it's really true. You should believe God for your next pair of shoes. Like he's the source of everything. But I remember I was like praying, and I still pray, Lord, give me an anointing to raise the dead. Give me an anointing to cast out devils. Give me an anointing to change nations. He goes, you need to start, why don't you just start by believing me for your rent? What was he doing? He was beginning. See, what, what you have to understand is your personal mountains that you begin to see conquered with the Lord then become a door that you can open others into a breakthrough that you'll need. Now, thankfully, years later, it's a settled issue, you know. I don't, you know, like, like you're like, you're like yeah, I, I have needs. Like, 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 my God supplies all my needs. It's a given thing I'm taking care of. Now it's how many thousands of, how many more thousands of dollars can we raise to help children? How many, but, but it's the same faith and same principle operating. David, I killed the lion and the bear. You're going down too, Goliath. 
when no one was looking, God was preparing him for a moment that would shift the nation. You think it's just a simple, oh, I'll just, you know, oh, that seems like a stretch and nobody's looking, you know, oh, I don't know if I can do that. Yeah, you need to do that. You think it's just, you know, like, oh, I need to prophesy to this person behind me in the supermarket. What's he doing? He's building your individual history with God. He's building that foundation inside of you. God is laying down a foundation for the people of God to be able to steward the greatest transformation of nations the earth has ever seen. Nations will change in a, in a moment of time. Here's some thoughts on like vision. God's spoken word gives us vision of the future, but it doesn't usually look like our current circumstances. Maturity demands that you never be defined simply by what you can see, feel, or, or what's in front of you. It's not faith then. The genius of the mind of God operates not from what is apparent, but from what is birthed from in here. That the world were formed by what was not seen. And that same mind of Christ has been given to every person in this room. You were actually created to originate a creative, a creative grace that comes outside of you through your union, through your intimacy with God. It wasn't supposed to exist on the earth except through your personality and through your expression. It's supposed to shift the earth, not be defined by the earth that you live in. Remember one time the Lord said to me, he said, the future belongs to those who see it as I intend it. We know that the fulfillment of our vision is not automatic. There's this co-laboring role. It's this positioning we talked about briefly today. We learn to value God's word. We learn to value scripture. We know this, that the road to fulfillment of the promises God is filled with opposition. But thank God he's promised that he's overcome everything that would face us. God is not overthrown by any challenge that you're facing tonight. God's not going, well, I don't know if they're going to, I don't know, I don't know if they, huh, I don't know how they're going to get through that one. Uh, Didn't know that was going to happen. <laughs> and I'm learning with every challenge, turn, turn, turn back. God, how do you see the situation? God is not unaware of unplanned circumstances. Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let not our hand be upon him. A good day for Joseph was that he wasn't killed. That was the original plan. And here's the other thing. Because God's hand is on your life, the enemy can't kill you. That's one of his lies, isn't it? When you're going through it, you're like, I'm going to die. You know? No, he can't kill you. Mm -hmm. Hey, come on. Say it again. <laughs> the enemy can't kill you. I remember this guy was going really, really fast one night in Brazil. I said, I'm not dying tonight. But I also don't want to go through life with any injury that the Lord did not plan for my life. <laughs> And his brothers listened, and the Midianite traders passed by. So the brothers pulled up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 seconds of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. I'm sure Joseph did not write that morning. And listen, how did he end up being sold into slavery? He obeyed God. He obeyed his father, but he was obeying God. Obedience will often put you in places and you're like, I thought you sent me here. Why is this happening? I know I did because I'm moving you one step closer to your destiny. Because here's another thing I've learned. A change in circumstances will often force the necessary changes for you to grow in graces that will help you fulfill your destiny. The circumstance in Joseph's life appealed totally contrary to the word of the Lord over his life. But God was moving him exactly where he needed him to be. 
Genesis 37, 31 through 36. His father's mourning, going, oh my God, my, my, my beloved son. You know, like, he was going to Harvard. <laughs> yeah. there, you know, I'm sure they felt that too, his brother. That's probably why they wanted to kill him. His dad is mourning his death, and God is going one step closer to changing a nation. Heaven has a way of looking at your, your circumstances and your environment totally different than you. Here's some tests Joseph walked through. Again, tests are not for the benefit of God. Tests are for our benefit to learn how to cooperate with the grace of God and shift appropriately. A big part of this is taking personal responsibility. Do you know, part of the reason I believe a victim mentality reigns even in the body of Christ and especially in America there are people in America that actually benefit from telling a whole group of people that they're victims. Yeah, the reason you're poor is because another rich guy is ripping you off. And it feeds into people. I wish you could maybe go to certain countries I want, and I'll tell you who's being oppressed. It's not the poor in America. Get a quiet when you say that, but but every one of us when we were born, we were victimized because we were born into Adam. But the blood of Jesus takes off all victimhood from every person in this room. Just as one man's sin affected us all and made us a victim, made us a victim of our own desires or having to sin or thinking we have to do things, we are no longer victims in Jesus. We, we, should ne- we, never, we never are to, I'm like this because of this or I'm in this because of this. That means we haven't understood the power of being a new creation in him. That means we really haven't understood the power of the blood of Jesus. You cease to be a victim the moment you became born again. Your entire history and your entire future are now in partnership with God and subject to change. Joseph had this test of responsibility. Responsibility is birth from identity. His understanding of identity caused his external environment to be affected by who he was in God. Here's a fascinating verse. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the Garden of Egypt, bought him from the Israelites who had taken him down there. The Lord... Now, here's two things to keep in mind in any challenge. The Lord was with Joseph. And he was successful man. Some translations say he was prosperous. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. I always read that and I go, how can a man be owned by someone else? The man can kill him. In fact, most commentators, scholarship believe that Potiphar probably did not believe his wife. Because if you did that to another man's wife in that day, especially because he was a slave, Potiphar could have killed Joseph on the spot. So how are you prosperous when another man owns you? It's a picture of life in the kingdom. Everything in the kingdom springs from here. He had a prosperous soul, a prosperous mindset, and eventually that shaped the environment around him. 
He did not take on the environment of a victim. He overcame it through who he was in God. And here's another thing. You can see in every step of the journey, he never missed that foundational piece of being a servant in the things of God. He served everywhere. If anyone had, had, had opportunity to go, whatever, dude. I love the picture because the butler and the baker come into prison and he's obviously been put in charge because he went to work everywhere he was. It's really important to be industrious. And he goes to them, he goes, why are you guys sad? Apparently he could say that because he wasn't sad. Mm -hmm. All in jail. <laughs> His inner life touched every part outside of him. He refused to be defined by the situation he was in. Were there limitations? Yes. But he chose to be defined by what was in here. Prosperity always begins on the inside. You can have a million dollars in your bank account and have a poverty spirit. Here's another key. Do you know, uh, here's another statement that Jesus said. If you believe, right? If you believe, how many believe? few you're like worried like <laughs> like maybe I think you know I don't want to, if you believe you'll see the glory of God Amen. one of the key places in our life and much has been said about this but it needs to be repeated is learning learning to cast down every vain imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and learning to discern the voice of the enemy and the voice of God. I've learned that any time I feel unsettled or agitated or fearful or, or kind of out of rest, I call it this, have you realized walking with the Lord and walking with the Holy Spirit, there's a rhythm every day. The last few days, like, like on Thursday, on Wednesday and Thursday, it was like, I didn't want to say anything. It's like, he just wanted to hang out. And like the last, the cadence changed over the last few days though. It became this, you know, everybody I can go on, you know, I was in the bathroom, she got up, you know, no, no, no. you know, like, <laughs> what happened? What happened? The rhythm changed. But I believe that the enemy understands one thing. He understands the power of belief. He understands it at least to this extent because he knew before Jesus went to the cross, he said to him, all the kingdoms of the world are mine. And Jesus did not rebuke what he said there because they were his at that time. And so where he works in the lives of believers, he works in the area of our thoughts, will, and emotion, and he works to, to gain ground through those areas. He works through those access points because he knows when we believe properly, we will see the glory of God. Here's what's interesting. In Genesis 3, the enemy had access to their thoughts and minds. He, had, he could dialogue with them. In Luke 4, when Jesus is about to begin his public ministry, what does he do? He challenges. One of the areas of Joseph's life is that you see that the Potiphar's wife, she didn't come to him once, and she probably didn't come to him when he was you know, really strong and had just finished praying in tongues. The enemy looks for opportune time when you're tired, when, you, when you've gone through some challenge, and he comes to access your thoughts, and he looks to get you in agreement with those thoughts so he can bring a, an area where, where, he can, where he can confine a space in your thinking. 
And it's so amazing because every day she came. So there's two pictures there. He learned how to cast every main evasion, every main eva- every vain imagination down, which was one of the keys to being victorious in this life. Me, not you. I'm driving along. They're like, you're crazy. And he tries to bring you areas that you're believing God for. And he tries to convince you of every area that's not going to work. You're going to go broke. You'll never have enough money for that project. Look at you. What do you, you I know those thoughts you had the other day. Look at you trying to worship the Lord. Me, not you. See, here's the interesting part about this. He will put thoughts in you. And you are not your thoughts. As long as it's what you do with your thoughts. Now, if you meditate on them, then eh, not good. But he'll put those thoughts and go, hey, I know what you thought the other day. No, that was your thought. <laughs> Here's another thing. You ever realize you have a relationship with yourself? <laughs> it's true. So David passed the test of integrity and also passed. It said day after day she came. Again, you find the picture, though, that he didn't look at himself as a victim. He could have been like, man, I'm a good-looking dude. I deserve this. God hasn't sent me my wife. You know, man's got needs. Lies. All these lies. Here's another thing. You are being discipled in an area of your thought process, either by God or the devil. See, one of the reasons that we must learn how to be people who are discipled and who disciple nations because we will either disciple nations or the nation will disciple the church. I think I can say this in this room. I, I'm going to finish and I've gone a while. I was in a place a few weeks ago. I was at a conference and a really nice lady. She loved Jesus. She bought a few CDs of mine. I was very thankful. She said, have you ever been to Cuba? I heard you're Cuban. Have you ever been to Cuba? I said, yes. She goes, yeah, I've been to Cuba too. And I go, yeah, my, my, I believe that many missionaries will come out of Cuba, and, I will, and I'm believing for a democratic, free nation where the people can do what God's called them to do. And she said to me, she said, you know, the Cuban revolution hasn't all been bad. Really? Tell me what about it was good. (laughs) And she explained some things. Listen, God is not conservative or liberal, but he does believe in free people. And he has nothing to do with communism. You want to really talk about have and have nots? In communists, especially in Cuba, less than 1% of the population controls 99.9% of the population. The ones on top are rich. The ones on the bottom are extremely poor, and there's hardly any food for them. What happened in this woman's life? She was discipled by a certain thought process, not by godly knowledge. You are either being discipled by God or the enemy in certain places in your life. And we all come to life with certain experiences, certain viewpoints. What is key for a follower of Jesus is to discern what you've learned about a certain area of life. Was that godly? Was that that influenced by this or that? And line it up with what God thinks about it. I don't know, I've never said that. I just felt like. 2 Corinthians 5, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. 
What are we doing? You know what's actually happening there? We are enforcing the victory that Paul spoke about in Colossians. That he has exposed every darkness and he made a public spectacle of them on the cross. What are we doing? We're aligning with that. We're saying, no, Jesus won the victory on the cross for me. I refuse to align with that lie in that area of my life. I refuse to give voice to that. I refuse to allow that to penetrate my heart, my mind, my will, and my emotions. I'm a child of the king, and I don't have to think that way. Any area of your life that is not filled with hope, that is not filled with an expectation of what God can do, needs to be thought about again. (laughs) Joseph was a steward of what he had. But the Lord, another state, again, you hear this statement over and over again. Do you know sometimes the greatest confession that you have is, thank you, Lord, that I know you're with me and that you're walking with me. You see that statement over and over again in Joseph's life. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. Say it, to, say it to your, over yourself today. The Lord is with me. And, the, and he gave him, this is, fa- this is amazing, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Do you know one of my most challenging times in ministry where it just seemed like everything I was doing was difficult and it was a difficult environment to work in. I'd walk in to different places and I, many times we're in these large churches. You'd walk into the green room and I'm with, working with another ministry at the time and, he, and almost every time the pastor goes, you! And he would like, the Lord's hand is on your life. Everywhere, there are thousands of people in a room. You! What was the Lord doing? I'm with you. I'm with you. Hang on to hope. Hang on to the word of the Lord. You are on the right path. And I don't know if you noticed this. Sometimes that anchor of hope doesn't cause everything in your circumstances to change the next day. Mm. <laughs> I love the picture of David being anointed by by Samuel to be the next king. It said, and the Holy Spirit came upon him from that day forward. The moment you became born again, he empowered you to do everything he's called you to do. But guess what? He wasn't king yet. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. He's a prisoner and he's prosperous. It is a little more challenging in certain nations where... uh, the, the system is not as free, especially under communism. But I have sat there and I go, Lord, how do you do this? He goes, my principles of my kingdom work everywhere. You can be prosperous under communism. You can be prosperous under any system because the principles of the kingdom work anywhere. Like they're like, you shouldn't teach prosperity. Everybody's poor here. That's like saying you shouldn't preach gospel salvation to people who are sinners. You ever think about that? Well, you're just a rich American. Are you going to just teach you? These people have nothing. Well, I know. I'm trying to help them have something. <laughs> That's a different sermon. It's, he has a dream when he's 17, and he's 30 years old when he stands before Pharaoh. And he did what I've done. He tried to help God. He goes, hey guys, I mean, it's natural. You're in prison. Remember to tell Pharaoh about me. I don't belong here. And they forget. I believe God allowed them to forget. Let me say this. What God has for you, he will use people but he will open a door no man can shut when it's the right time for the favor of God to come upon that assignment. 
And he will actually cause people who you think are supposed to help you to, not, to forget everything about you because it's not their role to help God in your destiny. And plus, he could have gotten out of prison, but he would have never changed a nation if he got out then. So Pharaoh has these dreams, two dreams. Remember, Joseph had two dreams. I'm convinced that when he, when he had those two dreams, he said, these are the dreams that I'm going to live my life by. I'm going to choose to believe that these dreams will come to pass no matter what the circumstance. And he stands before Pharaoh and he saves his own people and he also saves the, he also saves the Egyptian people and he saves them because he answers a question nobody else could answer in a nation. I believe that we're supposed to be people who answer questions no one else can answer in a nation. And I love the humility displayed by Pharaoh. Pharaoh goes, I've heard that you can answer dreams. And he goes, no, only God interprets dreams. Now tell me your dream. It's a picture, in my opinion, of a prophetic lifestyle. No, only God can do that, but let me be the voice of God to you. I don't know if you caught that. Only God interprets dreams, and then he interprets the dream. What happened? He became the voice of God to a man. That's what it means to be a prophetic person. I am an ambassador of God and I have the word of the Lord for your life. He gets into power and he passed the test of offense. You ever wonder what was happening there? I think he was really working through some things in his heart. Why not just go, I'm your brother. Bring your dad to me. He played a game with him. I could be wrong. (laughs) But learning to keep your heart free from offense. Here's another thing that I've learned. Even over the last few weeks, I was walking through this with the Lord. Like, you let something go. You free somebody. You know, um, because I was offended by a few things. Me, not you. I know you've never been offended by anything. <laughs> and I sure in a place like this, you've never been aff- offended at your pastors. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good <laughs> 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 So you're, you know, with all your heart, And one of the things I do, because sometimes the offense can be very hurtful or painful. But I'll just go, Lord, by your grace, anything in my heart, anything in my mind towards this person, I release them, I bless them. Oh, that felt good. Woo, thank you, Jesus. Woo, moving on. And then I was driving down the road, like, I don't know, this past week. And then he tries to replay what they did to you. Because he's trying to bring that spirit that came in through that offense back into you. He's trying to look for another foothold. And here's where you go. You do it again. No, no, no. I don't think you understand. I've already released them and I've already blessed them. And I'm going to do it again. Because even if you tell me they're my enemy, God says to bless my enemy. So I bless them. And Jesus, you have to speak back to that thing because that thing will try and replay in your heart over and over and over again. He'll, he'll use your own silence to bring you in agreement with him. You've got to open your mouth sometimes. You are your own greatest prophet sometimes. Final one was... He passed the test of success. I believe that God wants to trust us and trust the people in this room. I believe God wants you as a people in this, as this community, I believe this, with millions of dollars. 
What, what, what God has called you to do is, is going to take a lot of money. But He has all of it. But what will we do with what He gives us? You know, it's interesting. I have certain promises financially for myself. And I, and I read that scripture in Israel about the nation of Israel. He, said, he says to him, when I give you all this stuff, he goes, he goes you're going to forget me. And I always say, Lord, thank you because I know what you're about to do. So you have to expect it. But Lord, thank you because I'll never forget that you're the source of all things and I'm only the steward. What are we trying to do? We're trying to position ourselves to react properly in the moment that God wants to give us. So, Selah. Thanks for hanging with me. Did you receive this word tonight? Just lift your hands. Father, I declare in the name of Jesus, wherever your people need to apply this, Lord, give them understanding, give them grace, give them revelation, give them wisdom on how to apply this word. Father, I thank you that you're releasing a grace on a group of people to go the long haul. Father, I thank you that you're giving grace to a group of people to go like they've never gone and to go where they've never gone before. Lord, teach people how to discern the voice of God and the voice of the enemy. Teach people, teach us to cast down every vain, every vain imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Lord, thank you that we're people of integrity. And I call forth the dreams of God in every person. And I say, let it be so in Jesus' name. Let it be according to your word over their life. Let it be according to your word over their life. Let it be according to your word over their life.